What we'll do is uh, we'll open up with prayer, and then uh, Jack is going to teach us this morning on the the topic of, the topic of angels. So we look forward uh, to this Bible class uh, setting. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day in which we can come and and enjoy your creation and also to uh, worship you here on this first day of the week. Uh, We're thankful for all of our uh, family here at Hickory Knoll. We pray that you bless each of us. We're thankful also for all of our guests today and we're thankful for Jack and his family uh, for being here. We pray that you bless our time this morning as we continue to study from your word. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) Well, I love that no matter where you go, the church is the same. You know, I like that. I love... Brothers and sisters in Christ, love meeting them, being around them, having Christ in common. Greatest blessing in the world, amen? No, you maybe you didn't hear me. Greatest blessing in the world, amen? There you go. Talk to me now. Um, I want to discuss a few things today about angels, and I'm going to try it. I'll be turning and looking at this instead of this, because that's where you're going to be, and to make sure we're on the same page. <clears throat> the idea of of angels has always been intriguing to me. I guess it really got started whenever I assumed, and like the rest of the people, that Satan was a fallen angel. Now, let me preface this by saying he may very well have been. Uh, the Bible doesn't come out and say that he is a fallen angel. I know people uh, will turn to the book of Luke, and where Jesus said, I saw Satan falling as an angel, or not an angel, as lightning. And uh, has nothing there to do with saying Satan is an angel. People turn to Revelation 12 saying that it talks about Satan being cast out of heaven with, the, uh, with his angels. Uh, still that doesn't say Satan's a fallen angel. May very well have been. But that's what was the uh, precursor of me wanting to get into a study on angels. And uh, so as I looked at that and did that, uh, the word angel is applied in scripture to an order of supernatural or heavenly beings whose business it is to act as God's messengers to men and as agents who carry out God's will. Now this is a, uh, someone may ask me, and please I, I invite questions if you have questions. Uh, I'll tell you up front, I may not know the answer, but that's all right. And we'll just go on to the next question. But uh, Angels, you know, people ask, say, well, how do angels minister us? We'll get to that a little bit later on. You know, Hebrews 1, 13 and 14 say that angels are ministering spirits. Now, how do they minister to us? Now, I want to give you the theological answer to that. It's pretty simple. I do not know. I don't know in detail how angels minister to us. I just know that they do. I know in Revela- uh, Revelation, in 2009, April of 2009... I was diagnosed with prostate cancer and had that surgery. In July of 2010, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer, had that surgery, had a kidney removed. And even though I, I cannot come to you and say directly, I know this, and this is not a miraculous manifestation, so don't take it that way. But I, you know, I, I, sometimes you wonder, how are you going to get through things? You know, emotionally, how are you going to get through things? The loss of a loved one. Now, I've counseled with many people that have lost loved ones, lost children. And you wonder how you're ever going to get through that. Lost a mate. Uh, how, do you, how are you going to get through that? And maybe, just maybe, uh, that's how angels help us. They comfort us. I know we're going to find many places in Scripture. Uh, everywhere in the Old Testament, the existence of angels is assumed. The creation of angels is referred to in Psalm 148, 2 through 5. And I'm using the ESV here. And it says, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts, praise him, sun and moon, praise him. All you shining stars, praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. Now, uh, sometimes that blows people away. 
Well, how do we get the angels? Sometimes people think angels are always there. Well, no, angels are created beings. Uh, how did Satan, how did we get Satan? Anybody have an idea? Uh, how did Satan come about? Well, the created, only possible way, right? Uh, you know, whether he was a, an angel or not an angel, you know, that doesn't change anything because the only way that he would be here is because he is a created being, uh, created by God. Someone said, well, Brother Smith, you know, uh, you, you couldn't have Satan being created by God because God created evil. That wouldn't be right and all that stuff. How can God create anything evil? To which I replied to the person he created us. You know, we can get pretty evil at times. Isn't that right? So, you know, however this works out, the idea of angels is, is so, uh, so fascinating. Colossians 1 and verse 16, Paul told the church at Colossae, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Now, it's, this has always, always been something that just fascinated me. The very creation, the very earth that God spoke into existence. When God, you know, ex nihilo, out of nothing. When God said, this is going to be it, you know, and, and there it is. And the very creation that God created. And we understand, in, you know, in Genesis 1, uh, in the beginning God, and that word is Elohim in the Hebrew... It is a plural word. The next word is created. It's barach in the, in the Hebrew. And that is a singular term. So in the beginning, this plural God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created the singular creation. Meaning that all of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, had something to do with the creation of the world. Now here's here, herein lies the beauty. The very creation that Jesus created, he comes to it. To die for it. You know, and uh, you know, it's nothing we don't know. It's just, and we'll get to that a little bit later, fascinating study. Angels can sin. That's uh, something that we, that we see in, in Scripture. Job 4.18, even his servants he puts, no, in, even in his servants he puts no trust. And his angels he charges with error. Um, another verse, Job 15.15. 15, Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. Now we're going to get to something, a difference between us and angels in just a second, I think. But in Jude 1, well, Jude 6, that's the way it comes out whenever you put it on the uh, Esort. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority. Now watch. But left their proper dwelling, he has kept an eternal change under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So this seems to lend itself toward the idea that the real problem with angels and those angels that were cast down had to be a problem of power and authority. Now, I, let me just say this to you. I have been a, a around, as a matter of fact, I've been preaching 36 years, been at Airport Road 27 years. Um, be that as it may, in those 27 years, I have seen church problems. You know, if you preach any length of time, you're going to see church problems. And what I see in church problems, it's not a class on church problems, just making this reference. What I have seen in, in that, when we have little splinters and splits and all of this, what I have seen is, more often than not, it's a power struggle. Someone wanting power, someone wanting authority, someone not liking what's, what's going on, so they, well, they think they can do it better, and all of this. And, you know, they don't read passages like um, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, where Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, a young church, and he tells them, uh, he says, I command you to withdraw from all those who walk disorderly. Now, walk denotes a manner of life. Walking disorderly in the Greek is a military metaphor. It means those who are marching out of rank. So you withdraw from those. First Corinthians chapter 5, there's an issue with a, you know, a, a man that is having a, an incestual relationship, I believe with his stepmom, but still with his father's wife. And the Bible says, hand him over to Satan. And um, Titus 1 and verse 11, the Bible says, we're commanded to stop the mouth 
of the gainsayer. Those gainsaying are those who are trying to tear the church apart. In Proverbs 6, verses 16, verses, yeah, 6 through 9, I believe. Is that right? 16 through 19. Anyway, Proverbs chapter 6. The, the Bible talks about there are six things, yea, seven, that God hates or abhors. The reason it's mentioned that way, six, yea, seven, is for emphasis. He said, just like what Jesus said, verily, verily. And the very last thing that God hates is he who sows discord among the brothers. Now, all that taken into consideration, that's why in heaven, God says, I'm not standing for this. I'm not going to stand for it. So the angels, as you see here, talking about not staying within their own position of authority, they stepped outside that realm. We have scripture for that. Remember what the word of God says? It tells us in uh, uh, Deuteronomy 4 about verse 12, I believe it is. Uh, we're not to add to or take away. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, not to add to or take away. We are told in Jude um, 3, that we're to contend earnestly for the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. We are told also in Second John 9, not to go beyond that which is being taught. So in, in all of these things, the Bible is telling us, listen. You here in the kingdom of God on this earth, I expect you to remain within your position of authority. Remain who you are, where you are. And God set up you know, the government of the church. And we as Christians have certain things God expects from us. And we're not to go beyond that. Uh, that's why the elders are told in Hebrews 13 and verse 17 uh, that they watch out for our souls. And they'll give an account for that. And, you know, there's a certain authority issue. Uh, an elder, a deacon, or a member, none of us is to step beyond our own authority. God does not tolerate that. So that's something that especially is true in the, in the um, heavens. Angels are mentioned in 34 of the 66 books of the Bible. They are mentioned 108 times in the Old Testament. I've had people say, why do you list that? Nobody cares. Because it fascinates me. And because I'm teaching this class, that's why I'm 108 times in the Old Testament, 186 times in the New Testament, there's more written about angels than baptism, depending on what translation you use. It'll be some, you know, 24 to 28 different verses on, on baptism in the New Testament. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm just going to go through this. I can't. Come on now. Come on. There we go. When Jesus became God in the flesh... He was made lower than the angels. Now, this is a point I want to get to. <clears throat> this is something we have to understand. I, you know, I tell people all the time, even in counseling, the problem you're having is this. You have, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. You have, you know, Satan and any you know, way you want to put those. I've had people put them both ways. Satan and the angels and us. We have all these things that are more powerful than we are. We cannot get to here where we want to be without God's help. You know, we're, we're, this, this is going to be the struggle right here. Getting past uh, the idea of who we are. Getting past that. So we, we know that we were made a little lower than the angels uh, to become like us. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels... Namely, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Something interesting about this verse, just for your um, enjoyment or just for your information. I was debating a young man one time on a, and whenever I say I've had several debates, but on a small scale, don't think I'm more than I am because I'm not all that. But... um, Several debates, small scale. And the guy was, was talking about once saved, always saved. We were in Hebrews chapter 6. And in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, uh, you know, about those who go back into the world, that it's impossible to renew them. It's not talking about that there, there isn't any power in the cross and God can't forgive. It means some people become so hard-headed, you can't bring them back to the Lord. That's just the way it is. So uh, it talks about... Uh, and whenever I brought that up, he said, no, the Bible says they're just tasted of it. Just tasted of the heavenly gift. Doesn't mean he had it all. Doesn't mean he, you know, all this. So he wasn't really a Christian. He just tasted of it. 
to which I turn to Hebrews 2 and verse 9, which is the same Greek word, and where Jesus tasted death for everyone. Well, did Jesus really taste it, or he just kind of not do it at all? Was just kind of just a, a, you know, just a, you know, just a, a, like chocolate mousse. Anybody here ever have chocolate mousse? You ever had that stuff? I'll never have it again. You know, that, that's big to do about nothing. You know, it's, it's like whipped chocolate air, right? Put it in your mouth, it's gone. You know, you can't even, uh, you know, if you can't chew it. By the way, I had me some snails the other night now. Yeah, no crawfish, just snails. What kind of guy is this, you know? Jack, I don't give me any crawfish, what you want to feed you snails. So anyway, <laughs> and alligator. And I think poodle one time, I'm not <laughs> I'm just teasing, just teasing. We have a poodle, so don't quit. Anyway, let me get this. Huh. There you go. The difference between angels and us. This is where I wanted to, to get to. This is a question a lot of people ask. What's the difference? Am I supposed to point that towards this or towards this? One said here, one said over here. It's not supposed to matter? Okay. Do what? There you go. Uh, angels couldn't repent. Now, what's the main difference? You read through scripture. When an angel, because of their position where they were, and you would expect this, whenever you, you know, you, the, logicos, the, the logic that you put to this, and so we have to be careful about human logic. Whenever we set our minds to think about this, that makes perfect sense. Why is it that angels, whenever they, they send, they were cast down? You know, one translation says, to the chains, to fire, to hell. You know, so why were they cast down? Well, that's pretty simplistic, really, because Jesus was made a little lower than the angels to become like us. Jesus on this earth, Hebrews 4 and verse 15, was tempted in all manner as a man, yet without sin. But the angels were not given the opportunity to repent. Now, why do you think that is? I'm going to ask you. Why were the angels? Yes, sir. And I think it's first, first Peter. Okay. I can't remember. It says that the angels looked into a marvel at the fact of our salvation. Mm-hmm. One of the things they have a problem understanding is the fact that we can bounce back and forth in our opinions. The reason for that is. We are living in a four-dimensional universe that has time. It's temporal. Where they are, time does not exist. If they decide, that's it. Yeah. They have always decided. They always will decide. Mm-hmm. Okay. Did everybody hear that? There, yeah. So there can be no Very good. Exactly. Um, so that's the basic idea. They being spiritual beings and in heaven were held accountable without facing the judgment like we will. Now, the angel is going to be judged. I mean, they are already judged. We understand that. But I'm talking about going through this life like we do and like you say, the opportunity to change our mind and all of this. Uh, they're unlike we are. The other thing, when they sinned, they were cast down into, in, uh, not to Hades, but in gloomy darkness, June 6th. Um, Come on now. Only two angels are specifically named, Michael and Gabriel. Uh, Some say angels are to be worshipped. You hear that. And, uh, uh, you know, I I saw a lot of things today. uh, Today. Uh, Yesterday, a lot of places where I went. um, It was shown around. Had a lot of angels and all of this. And, you know, I don't know about angelology here. But the Bible condemns this practice. It's not to happen. Um, Colossians 2 and verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. Now, anybody know what asceticism was? Okay, let me tell you what that is. Uh, Asceticism was a belief that the more you punished yourself, the closer you were to God. And so a lot of the people would would hold themselves up in brick walls and have a little little, um, slot there where they would be fed bread and water, whatever sustenance they they desired, but they would just, you know, punish their bodies. And the more that they did that, they thought the closer they were to God because matter was evil. 
And so that's what it's saying here. No, go back, back to the other one. One more. Thank you. Um, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions <laughs> puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Now, I'm going to do that. Here we go. In Acts 10, Peter bowed to an angel who told him to get up. Now let me, here we go. Some say angels don't have feelings. Well, uh, I disagree with that. Um, scripture tells us, the Bible says that they have curiosity, something what the gentleman's talking to us about. First Peter 1 and verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So angels have curiosity. Um, that's a, an interesting thing. Every single turn that we find in, in Scripture, we're going to find, if I get to it, I have time to get to it. And I, I should end, what, about 10 till? Is that good? That's going to be the first bell. 10 till, okay. Or, or maybe 5 till will be the first bell. Okay. 11 o'clock per second. Okay, good. So, um, you know, as we look at these things, angels long to know. Angels rejoice when sinners repent. We all know this. And uh, so, Luke 15 and verse 10, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, there was a... Um, I, you know, I, I think that Christianity, and, you know, I, I love to, uh, to enjoy Christianity. You know, I don't believe in harsh jesting, although I've probably all of us have been guilty of that in our lives. Uh, but I do believe having fun, don't you? I believe that Christians can smile and serve the Lord. I believe we can be happy. I believe that that attracts people. The uh, reason I'm saying that is because there obviously there was joy in heaven, rejoicing in heaven. We go around, look like we've been baptized in vinegar, and uh, uh, people, we're so grumpy, you know, and we appear to be brother and sister cantankerous to everybody. And then we're going to look at the world and say, why don't you come be miserable with us? You know, man, we're just, you know, I remember preaching at a gospel meeting one time. And uh, uh, Sister Asp said, said uh, what, are you, what are you preaching on? And I said, well, the elders have asked me to, to preach on unity. And she snickered. She said, I don't know why. I said, We've been unified for years. We're frozen together. You know. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this, you know. And, and, and look at those secret things and, and joy. Uh, I remember preaching another gospel meeting. And I don't know why they think whenever you preach a gospel meeting, especially whenever you have gray hair, that all of a sudden you're supposed to be wise beyond your years. But I remember an eldership calling me in. They said, I want to talk to you. You know, so I don't know if I was in trouble or what. It was like the second day of the gospel meeting. And they said, you know, uh, and what they didn't know, I'd already had lunch with the preacher. And the preacher told me that he was fired. You know, said so the elders have fired me and I've got I have three months or whatever, whatever, whatever. And uh, so the elders were talking to me about this. And, uh, of course, in confidentiality, I have to act like I don't know anything's going on. And so the elders said... Uh, so we just want to know if you know of anybody that can that we, you'd recommend to come here and all that. And I said, well, let me ask some questions. Uh, because before I recommend somebody going someplace, I want to know what you're all about. And I said, uh, so you've told me that you're firing the man you have now. Why are you firing him? He said, well, we don't have enough baptisms. I said, okay. You don't have enough baptisms. Fair enough. How many baptisms have you had this year? This congregation about 150 people. He said, well, we've had eight baptisms this year. I said, okay, out of the eight baptisms, how many baptisms of those eight did the minister study with them or help encourage them? Was he responsible for bringing to the Lord? They said, well, all eight. I said, well, sir, to me, it seems like you need to fire the congregation and keep the preacher. You know, maybe fire the elders, keep the preacher. I didn't go back there for a gospel meeting again. That was the only time they asked me. But, uh, you know, the point of that, the point of all that being that we sometimes we make things more difficult than what they're supposed to be. And we get things we get things backward. You know, the Bible says 
that one man sows, one man waters, and what happens? God gives the increase. You cannot, you cannot always, always, and I want to say this very carefully, you cannot always, under, you know, uh, can always have the idea of the church growth and always see how well a congregation is doing only by looking at numbers of baptisms. You know, the, uh, the church growth going on, there are different things going on. People need to, we need individual development and congregational development. And, you know, you, you just can't always go by that. Uh, I know of, of places that are baptizing 100 and 150 people a year. The problem with that is they're not preaching the truth. You know, they're, they're getting people and, and baptizing them into Christ and then teaching them wrong. And, you know, there you go. So it's not, you have to be very, very careful about those things. This is joy in heaven. Christ's entire life on earth was touched by angels. Boy, I, I, I like this. Um, I hope this thing works. After the wilderness temptations, angels ministered to him. Now, can you imagine? There you are. You're uh, fasting for 40 days. And all of a sudden, then Satan attacks. Remember, he attacks. Jesus goes into wilderness wanderings. He's attended. Well, whenever he, he goes in there, he's led into the wilderness by whom? Do you remember? Who leads Christ in the wilderness wanderings? Or well, wilderness wanderings? Into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit. Okay? And while he's in there, then after this, he's ministered to by angels. And uh, this is always a, a, an interesting thing to see. Because in his lifetime, he also quit. Come on now. I know Eric doesn't have any problem with this whatsoever, does he? Do you have a problem with this, Eric, at all? In other words, what he's doing, he's, yeah, he, he's smarter than this is what he's saying. Okay. Uh, during the cross, he could have called 12 legions of angels. Uh, how many angels are in a legion? Anybody know? Well, during this time, about 6,000. So we sing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. You know, why do we say that? Because it fits better than 72,000 angels, you know. But uh, this is a, an interesting thing. Nearing the cross, he could have called 12 legions of angels, 72,000 angels. How many did he need? He could have had one. Well, he didn't even have to have that. You're right. He didn't have to have that. With his power, he could have just dispersed the whole, whole thing. It's interesting things about the cross. <clears throat> on which our Lord was crucified. The only time on this earth that Jesus calls God, God, is on the cross. You're aware of that? Every other time, he's calling him Father. On the cross... He yells out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's the only time he calls him God. Also, on the cross, on the Calvary that day, there are three crosses. Uh, Another sermon I love to preach. And those three crosses represent every person on earth today. Always have, always will. Sometimes we don't see that. How does it represent all of us? Because there on that day... There was someone that was hanged on a cross that didn't need to repent. Someone on a cross that needed to repent and did. And someone on a cross that needed to repent and didn't. So it covers all humanity right there on the cross. On those three crosses. So it's a beautiful thing. Um, After praying in the garden, an angel strengthens him. Also, angels roll the stone away. Matthew 28. I'm trying to go as quickly as I can. Angels at the ascension in Acts 1 and verse 11. Remember that? They were there. The apostles must have been a dreary time for them. In Acts 1 and verse 11, there are 11 apostles. Um, We had 14 apostles in the New Testament. From what I can understand, you know, with Matthias being added, Judas taken away, that's 13. Paul, 14th apostle. And so as we, as we see this in Acts 1 and verse 11, the apostles are there, the angels are there. And he says, you know, why are you stand here amazed? This same Jesus that you see ascending will one day descend. He's coming again. So it's a beautiful thing there also. Jesus refers to angels in 22 specific verses. 
And by the way, all this is on slides, and I don't mind. I'm not going to get through all of it today. I have about 784 slides. No, not that many. 30-something, I think. And you're welcome to use that material if you want to. Uh, Every time angels appeared, they were as men. Uh, The word angel from angelos is masculine. And so um, that's not to be... That's not to be condescending to women. It's just the way the Bible has it written. Some say when we die, we become angels in heaven. Uh, That is a misnomer. I I hear it a lot. You know, well, um, my loved one died. They're going to be an angel in heaven. We don't become like angels. According to Luke 16, when saints die, they are carried by angels to paradise. In this account, it is interesting that Lazarus remained Lazarus. Some people believe it's a parable. Some believe it's not a parable. Regardless, it's teaching us a lesson. And I do not believe whenever we die, we become like angels. Whenever we die, we are transfigured, transformed, and we become like Christ, not like an angel. There's a reason for that. Now, we're going to be co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ in heaven. Now, I like that. Jesus said on this earth, talking to us, he said, I will not leave you orphanos. Uh, That word in the Greek means orphan. And it is tantamount, equal to the idea in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son comes back. And when the prodigal son comes back, uh, I can only imagine what's going through his mind. Uh, You know, I've been really, really hungry in my life. And when I grew up, the, my mom's mom and dad always kept a five-gallon lard bucket over at the side of the table, which is really yummy, you know. And that's where we put the scraps in to take out to feed the hogs. And, well, I could, I, I remember carrying that bucket like this because I wanted to be manly enough to carry that stuff out there. And, boy, have you ever smelled hog slop? You know, doesn't smell good, does it? I have done a lot of that, slopping the hogs. I have never one time looked at that and gone, yum. Not one single time. I've got to have some of that now. It was terrible. This young man, it says, he was even wanting to eat what what was being fed to the hogs. He came to himself and he goes home. Every single step coming home. But what's amazing is that in that depiction of that, they give him a, a signet ring, which signifies you're part of the family. This is the, you know, the, uh, the seal. This is what it's going to be. You know, you can stamp that and wax, whatever. There you are. Put a robe on him. You're welcome to my house. A welcome robe. And the most amazing thing about that is he, put, he said, put sandals on his feet. You know why? Because the orphans, the street urchins of that time, were sandalless, shoeless. So he says, I want to announce to everybody around here, he's not fatherless. My son is home. So, you know, in in all of this, uh, you know, I I say that to get uh, to this idea. Whenever we leave this world, I believe that whenever Christians die, we do not go directly to heaven. I don't believe we do. Um, Other people do, and that's fine. Uh, You know, we're going to all find out. There's no use getting an uproar about it. But I believe whenever we die, we go to the Hadean realm, Hades. And Hades is divided into two places, Abraham's bosom and Tartarus, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, or um, the unjust. And there is this gulf between us. We understand that from Luke 16. And that somebody says to me, well, Brother Jack, that means then that if we do that, we already are, we already know where we're going. Well, yes, um, I have no problem with that. Well, then when are we going to face judgment? Well, keep in mind that there has to be a place for us to go (laughs) when we die for the spirits, our souls to go, if we're not going directly to heaven, to wait for judgment. You know, it'd be kind of redundant for us to die and go to heaven and become out of heaven in order to be judged and go back into heaven. Right? So... Whenever you figure out that the word there for judgment from krino, krino mai, the word means the passing of sentence. It's like someone today in our judicial system. I think that's why the um, illustration is given. That in our judicial system, when somebody is is found guilty, you know, and uh, then we have the sentencing process. And then when the sentencing process, that person is judged, Right? You've been found guilty. Now this is your judgment. 
So from Krenoma, the idea is the pronouncing of judgment. So it still fits. Whenever we die, we go to the Hadean realm and we wait for that to happen. When angels die, or die, whenever angels are cast out of heaven, they are sent directly to a place not where we are. Daniel 9, 21 and Revelation 14, 6 represents angels as flying. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to, I have about three minutes left. First bell hasn't rung yet, has it? But it should have because it's time. I have time? Okay. Uh, but nothing is said about them having wings. Now, there's so many different things I want to get to. Who were the cherubim and the seraphim? Now, I'm not going to be able to get to this one, but you hear about teraphim. You ever heard about the teraphim? Okay. Teraphim is also mentioned once in the Bible, and it's a man-made idol. Don't get that confused with cherubim and seraphim. <laughs> See, I knew I wouldn't have time to get at all this. Cherubim is a Hebrew plural for cherub, and we understand cherub were winged creatures with four faces, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. And uh, cherubim placed at the entrance to, the, uh, to Eden to guard the tree of life. Come on. Genesis 3.24, he drove out the man, and at the east of, of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that uh, turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And... God told Moses to place two cherubim of beaten gold on the mercy seat above the ark. Trying to go faster I get someplace. It's found in Exodus 25, 18 through 20. Let me get to something else. Curtains on the tabernacle were embroidered with cherubim, Exodus 26 and verse 1. God dwelt between two cherubim, what the Bible says, number 789. That was the bell, wasn't it? First bell. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak, with the Lord, he uh, heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. Uh, David sings of God riding on a cherub. Next one. Now he rode on a cherub and flew, and he was seen on the wings of the wind. Now, of course, you know this is uh, figurative language, not literal. Okay, everybody understand that? God has no need to fly on anything. It's just the way this is depicted here, the beauty of it in the, uh, the literature. Cherubim seemingly are the, uh, the living chariot, so to speak, when God appears to man. Also, although never mentioned as angels, cherubim and seraphim are winged creatures who are said to live in the heavens. I want to stop right there because I can't breathe. Okay. I went very hurriedly. I have about a ton more of that. Uh, matter of fact, I, I can leave this with somebody. You want me to leave this with you? You just sound so excited, brother. I just don't know. <laughs> we have any, any questions before you, sir? Any questions before we close? I mean... On anything Bible related, since I have a minute to ask to answer you. Do you think that any of the uh, angels came to the earth? It talks about the created giants. Um, Genesis, no. And, uh, about yeah, Genesis, Genesis six, and <clears throat> I, right. There. Uh, you know, I. The only th- and the, the only way it could possibly have happened, and people don't like the answer, but it's the only way it could possibly happen, because they live, you know what, 935 years, 965 years, all these years. I believe that, uh, of course, brothers were marrying sisters, and it's the only way it happened. The reason I, I believe in that, I believe in the, what's known as the canopy theory. Are you familiar with the canopy theory? Okay, the first time that we know of rain on this earth was Genesis chapter 9. Canopy theory is like this big, you know, this big house, you know, this big, um, what am I trying to say? Where plants grow, greenhouse, yeah. And, you know, the, the rays weren't there and all this. Things grew taller, things grew bigger, things had more nourishment and all of this. That's from where that comes. You had a question?
discussion about a couple of weeks back was whether or not it was possible for the idea of good to exist without evil. And that God had to create Satan for us humans and our meager understanding to have any kind of an understanding of good and evil, to understand how good God is and He created that for us to understand. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that in order for us to have volition, freedom of choice, there has to be, had to be a choice. And, um, and, and this, is, this is where faith comes in. Uh, because people will say, well, why didn't God just create a perfect universe when there never was a sin? Well, because the way God designed it, he wants us, we're designed to worship God and to worship him freely. And to wor- that's what the cross is all about. My mother, bless her heart, she and I talked about religion for years and years and years. Um, quick story about that. Now, I know we're going to go. Somebody else had one question. I'll let you go. But the, um, my mom never obeyed the gospel. Never did. Tore me up. But I finally realized it was her decision. You know, she had the right to make a decision. I can't make it for her. But uh, anyway, so you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Just, a, just one second. You had a question? Okay, go ahead. Yes. Uh, was Satan sent to earth before we came? We brought up I wish I knew. I, I don't. When he was cast out of the parents, yeah. he was cast out of the earth. You know, I... Now, we have to be careful. In, in, in Matthew, uh, Matthew, in, in Revelation 12, where the Bible says that Satan was cast down, okay, in, in Revelation 12, I believe that's talking about, because it says the very first of that, that a woman had a child. And as a result of a woman having a child, there was a battle went on between Michael and Satan. I believe that is figurative language depicting that when Jesus came on this earth, that's when you hear about demon possessions and demons. I think Satan did everything he could to keep this, just depicting the battle between good and evil, if you will, and that they were doing everything they could to keep Jesus off that cross. So Satan unleashes everything he has. So therein is the battle. But to answer your question of was Satan in the garden before Adam and Eve or whatever, I don't know. I know he found, he found his way there. Right, right. And how that happened, I, you know, the Bible doesn't say, I don't know. I, I, I think Satan's a created being. Anybody else, we're out of here. Goodbye so long. Fare thee well. Thank you.